Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It is wonderful to have you here today. Thank you to those watching at home on Facebook Live, the video later on YouTube. Happy second Sunday in Lent. I have a number of announcements, which is usually the case in this season. We want to provide lots of opportunities for that, that study, that devotion, those acts of service uh, that are what Lent is about. You may have noticed as you walked in, we have a little competition going. We have a couple of buckets out there to collect items for Lutheran World Relief kits. I see some of you even went so far as to bundle them up already. That's cool, but leave them loose because on Easter Sunday, we're going to bundle up all the items. We're going to have an assembly line during the Easter breakfast. We're going to see who contributed more kits. Will it be the youth of Messiah Lutheran and their families or everybody else? And right now, the youth are winning. <laughs> there are less... I think youth families and everybody else, I'm just saying. I gave them a head start, but they got you like doubled up right now. So. I'm not usually one to uh, make people try to compete against each other, but in this case, it's all for a good cause. So keep it coming. We might need bigger boxes. This is wonderful. Uh, so that's one thing going on. We also have our adult class on Sundays called uh, Layers of Lent, Inspiring Stories of Faith. It's not just stories of saints that are inspiring to us, but I'm hoping that these inspire our own stories. So we've been practicing telling stories of our lives, of people who have inspired us in class, so that we can turn around and share those stories out in the world. We're putting some flesh and bones on the gospel in ways that are just real, that make sense. So we're practicing that. If you can't make it to those classes, that's fine. The videos will be out there later. I encourage you to watch them. Uh, there's some good stories being told. I talk a lot at the beginning, and then I shut up and let everybody else talk. I try. Um, what else do we have going on? Lenten soup suppers and worship. Every Wednesday during the season of Lent, we will have uh, a soup supper at 6.15. Worship begins at 7. We had our first one last week. We are teaching you all to make prayer tables in your home during worship, and each week we will have an item from the passion story of Matthew, uh, Jesus' passion, uh, to focus your prayers on. Uh, we're also singing a really lovely uh, evening worship setting, and we're, we're learning it as we go, but it's, it's very accessible, very singable, and, and quite wonderful. And we need help with those. We need uh, help for volunteers, and thank you to Karen. I don't know if Karen gets this a lot, but she does a lot of behind-the-scenes work. She took over for the person sitting right next to her who used to do the job, Sally, of organizing all of our volunteers every Sunday and every worship service. And so thank you, Karen, for the, all that work, and Sally. And uh, thank you all for signing up to volunteer to bring meals, pieces to the meal for the soup suppers, and to do all the things that happen in worship, before worship with Altar Guild, after worship, the counters and cleanup, all of that. Thank you. It does not go unnoticed. But we do need some sign-ups for those soup suppers. Uh, they're out there. I don't know how many spots are still open, uh, but uh, sign-ups for soup, bread, salad, desserts. Keep in mind we're looking for one uh, vegetarian vegan soup. Uh, per Wednesday as well. Uh, we're updating our church directory. Uh, that's sitting out there. All you need to do is stop and take a peek at it, make sure your information is correct. Uh, we want that all, all comments, all corrections done by next Sunday. So please get that in there. Uh, a couple weeks from now, there will be a worship team meeting on the 19th after service uh, where we'll just discuss. Like we, It came a long way after COVID and all the restrictions. What now? Get back to old things, try some new things, let's see. Uh, so we'll have that conversation too, and anything else related to our worship time together. Um, I feel like we got confirmation uh, youth group today after worship. Women's Bible study is tomorrow. That is a Lenten change, so we don't compete with the Wednesdays. Women's Bible study is tomorrow. It is, I got it right there. Yeah, First Sunday fellowship today in the fellowship hall. It is nice to hang out right here, but it's also nice, like I said, I'm trying to get people to tell stories. So let's go down to the Fellowship Hall, let's sit down, and we will uh, have some time around the tables, tell some stories, uh, catch up with each other. It's a nice time to be able to, to sit down. So thank you to Becky for organizing that and all the snacks that get brought in for that. Is that everything? Anything else? All right, there are a few other things in the bulletin. There's stuff that comes out. In the weekly email, please keep on top of that. Read your newsletters. Keep up to date.
I invite you to stand as you're able. We'll begin our time of worship together with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Let us acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and God's mercy. Holy God, we confess to you our faults and failings. Too often we neglect and do not trust your holy word. We take for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward your creation. We cause hurt though you call us to heal. We choose fear over compassion. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us as we seek to follow in your way of life. Amen. Hear the good news. God so loved the world that God gave the only Son so that all may receive life. This promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy, forgives you in Christ's name, and revives you in the Spirit's power. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together our gathering song. It is, We Are Baptized in Christ Jesus. It's number 451. Continue on page 203, 203, in the front of your hymnals. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. asking for mercy and to singing glory be to God for that which we receive.
Let us pray together. O God, our leader and guide, in the waters of baptism, you bring us to new birth to live as your children. Strengthen our faith in your promises, that by your spirit, we may lift up your life to all the world through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first lesson this morning is from Genesis 12. God's call of Abram and Sarai has a clear purpose that through them all the families of the earth would gain a blessing. As they set out on their journey, they are accompanied by promises of land, nation, and a great reputation. A reading from Genesis. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from Romans 4. In the person and example of Abraham, we discover that a right relationship with God does not involve earning a reward from God, but entails trusting God's promises. Abraham is the forebear and model for both Jews and Gentiles, because we too trust that ours is a God who gives life to the dead. A reading from Romans. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works... Wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be their heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand as we sing the gospel acclamation on page 205.
Just the first round. <laughs> Anybody in the back? I got a big four here. Okay. Try to be The sound loves you very much, but nothing will ever change that. Yeah, I'll put back here. Okay. You guys getting outside your family? I love you very much, and nothing will ever change that. Anybody else? Back here, one of you guys want to get Miss Lois back here? Yeah. Yeah. I got you. That's why we practice. That's why we practice. I love you very much, and nothing will ever change that. All right. This is why we practice it here, so you can go back up. Oh, I lost one. She's like, <laughs> All right, I have something else for you. So I said about presents, so I want you to try this. This is a teddy bear, a Nintendo Switch, a bicycle, and a board game. And I have arrows. So if this is a present you got, it's like a blessing, it's a good thing you got, I want you to try to imagine some way that you could turn around and be a blessing to others with that present. So draw a picture, write some words. How can we use blessings, these presents, these good things? Be a blessing for somebody else. Yeah, let's see if those animals go to the Gracious God, thank you for all the blessings you give us, all the good things in the church, in our families, in our lives. Thank you for all the good stuff. Help us to be a blessing to others, to share the good stuff in any way we can. Everybody around us, teach them and show them love. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you both. And I think the colored pencils are still back there. There was a bucket of stuff. If not, check out the deck. I should say, if I gave you a blessing, I guess that means you need to turn around and bless somebody else today. You've got the perfect time with fellowship. First Sunday of fellowship. <laughs> one of my favorite comedy movies of all time is Spaceballs. It spoofs all sorts of classic science fiction movies. It's got lots of great lines, one liners, very quotable, lots of sight gags. And it has John Candy playing Bart, which is short for Bartholomew. And he is a mod. As he says, I'm half man, half dog. I'm my own best friend. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen it, now you get an idea of the kind of humor we're talking about. But going on underneath all of the silly stuff, there's actually a decent story. I mean, it's dumb, but it's still kind of a good story. And part of that story is the relationship between Lone Star, the rough around the edges reluctant hero, and Princess Vespa. <coughs> When Lone Star first rescues her, they, they don't get along very well. But thanks to the magic of the movies, before long they realize they have feelings for each other. They fall in love. But there's a catch. Vespa is only allowed to marry a prince. Lone Star is not a prince. As the movie gets close to the end, the bad guys are, sorry, spoiler alert. As the movie gets close to the end, the bad guys are defeated. Vespa is returned home to the boring Prince Valium, the wedding. Lone Star leaves feeling somewhat down, but then he learns that the medallion he's had ever since he was left at an orphanage as an infant is actually a royal birth certificate. He is a prince. <laughs> <laughs> he pushes back before Vespa marries Valium. Lone Star and Vespa get married instead and live as happily ever after as one can in a universe created by the world. <laughs> This part of the comedy story about falling in love with someone outside your social status, star-crossed lovers kind of thing, it's pretty standard fare for books, movies, fairy tales, all sorts of things. How could this person ever love me? We're from such different worlds. Even if we were to be together, the rest of society would try to keep us apart. It's comedy. You can't change what you're born into. Or can you? In real life, for most of history, for most of the world, this isn't just the backstory of a silly movie or a fairy tale. The situation you were born into really did determine and predestine 
the course of the rest of your life. Most people didn't find a magical medallion that let them bump up a level or two. Where and to whom you were born, which layer of the social structure, these things decided virtually everything about who you would be forever. Where you lived, what your job was, your social and economic status, who you could marry, and so on. After all of this introduction I've given you, you won't be surprised to hear that this predetermination based on your birth and where you were was part of the culture and custom of the folks that we read about in the Bible as well. It's fairly common. Now, I, I have some books that really focus in on the sociology, the anthropology of the New Testament, all of this cultural stuff that's going on that we might just not pick up on today. In one of the comments on the story from John's Gospel about Nicodemus' nighttime visit, they get to talking about how people were born into their social status, and that changing it at any point in your life was very uncommon. You are what you are. Nicodemus is like, how can you be born a second time? That's why when the Bible tells these stories about people moving away from their roots or making some other significant change, stepping outside their designated at birth lane, it would have been an eyebrow raiser and a big deal for the folks hearing the story because such things just weren't done. You were born here, you stay here. I have examples. David going from a shepherd to a king was, especially as like the seventh youngest, was sort of like a fantastic fairy tale on some levels. And so the story makes it very clear that it is only because of God's intervention into David's life that any of this was possible. Abram, as we heard today, pulling up stakes and leaving his entire family, his whole support system behind, to move to a strange, never-before-seen place, all on God's say-so, that would have been unthinkable. Jesus traveling all over the region, not following in Joseph's carpenter footsteps would have seen, been seen by many as scandalous and suspicious. And all the folks that just up and follow Jesus when he calls, like they literally just drop their stuff and follow him. They leave behind their work, their family, their responsibilities, their understood place in the world would have been strange and against the grain. It takes a lot for Nicodemus to come and tell Jesus, who's this social disruptor, that he's clearly a teacher, that God is with him. Granted, he comes at night when no one else can see him. You have to be careful with who you associate with. It might mess up your social status. But he's there. Nicodemus comes and talks to Jesus. Either way, it isn't long before Nicodemus is just plain confused by Jesus. John's Gospel does this a lot, by the way. Jesus will say something cryptic, and he'll say, what? And then he'll say, here's what I mean. That's kind of how we work with John's Gospel. You know, I can't say I blame Nicodemus. Jesus is really confusing in this passage. I don't know if you followed everything, but all the born from above and back and forth. He's kind of telling puns, double meanings. He's not really giving Nicodemus straight answers. And then he kind of scolds Nicodemus when he's understandably but Nicodemus is also confused because in between the plays on words and the, the weird ways of saying it, Jesus is changing the rules. Be born from above, Jesus says. Another way to translate that is to be born anew, to be born again. In other words, your original honor status, which was imprinted on you at your birth, by the situation of your birth, Jesus is saying, let's reset it. Be born anew. Be born again. Be born from above. Let your birth situation be that of a child of God. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter your family, your social status. Be born anew as a child of God. What? Be born anew. Be born from above, from God. Let God be your father and the claim upon which you stake your honor. Jesus is the firstborn, of course, with all the perks that go with it, but after that, Jesus is saying, every other child of God, every other born from above, born in the spirit, honor status reset individual, gets equal, uniform child of God status. Everybody. 
Paul's words from the letter to the Romans say the same kind of thing, same kind of rule change. Paul says to the church in Rome that based solely on God's grace, your inheritance of righteousness, your claim as a descendant of Abraham, is a matter of faith. Trust in God, following God's lead, following Jesus' call. Your inheritance and your claim are not based on your birth situation. Your family ties, your connections, your works, Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. You are a child of God because God makes it so. Our God who gives life to the dead, who calls into being the things that do not exist, even your family tree, even your honor, even your birth status. You are a child of God because God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. God didn't send the Son to the world to condemn the world, but so that everybody would have this opportunity to be reset. Now, if you are a fan of family trees, if you've gotten into the whole genealogy, Ancestry.com thing, difficult to pronounce names if you're a fan of those, then you should check out the Bible. The books of Genesis, Numbers, Chronicles, Matthew, Luke, and lots of other places have these genealogies, chapters long, lists of names begetting names begetting names, big family trees. There's poetic litanies, carefully preserved, passed down for generations, highly esteemed chains that linked the people of Israel all the way back to the prophets, to the kings, all the way back to Abram, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel. These lists in the Bible, they might not be the most exciting things to read, but they're there for a reason, to show your connection to this chain, to this birth status, to this honor. Imagine how amazing it would be to hear Jesus or Paul say that you have a place in this line, this family, this, this rich heritage, this family tree and genealogy. Your name, too, is meaningful, worthy of a place of honor in the chain of beginning. By trusting in God solely by faith, you, too, are God's child, heir to God's promises, heir to God's salvation, no matter where you came. No proof of bloodline required. No matter what, you've been reset. You're in. Imagine that. How good would that be? Then imagine how that same invitation might sound to those who are already in the family tree, in that line. Those whose names are already on the list. Those who follow the rules already given by God and commandments and other statutes, ways of life, structures passed down for almost as long as you've had ancestors. Passed down through the generations all the way to you. And you hear Jesus saying, everybody can be in. At the least, you'd be confused and astonished like Nicodemus. What is he talking about? But probably you'd be more than confused. You'd be angry. You'd be upset. Territorial. Defensive. How can they get to get in? I did everything I was supposed to do. They just get a free pass. If you have ever turned someone away, maybe you're the old sibling that always makes the younger sibling be the, be the villain. Play hide and seek without actually seeking. ever displayed a numbers only attitude or a click in your work or your school or your leisure if you've ever felt or expressed judgment or condemnation for or looked down your nose at some other person or group just because of the honor status that you or they were born into to no merit of your own of their own that you've achieved if you've ever said who let them in if you've ever looked from the inside to the outcasts and were fine with that status quo and approved of their being on the outside because they're just not like us, they're just too different. If you've ever done that, then this rule change that Jesus talks about, this level playing field, this open door being presented by Jesus, by Paul, on behalf of God, what well, is confusing and it is 
threatening, it's convicting. And if you've ever been that younger sibling, left out of the plane, if you've ever been the shun or the outcast, the proverbial loser, if you've ever felt judged or condemned or looked down upon because of the honor status that you or they were born into with no merit of your own, that they've achieved. Maybe it's just been assigned to you or projected onto you. Then this rule change, this level playing field, this open door being presented by Jesus and Paul on God's behalf, then it's going to feel liberating. It's life and salvation. Instead of who, who, excuse me, instead of who let them in, you're saying, he let us in. Nowadays, we aren't quite as locked in ever. I don't work on an assembly line making outdoor, outboard motors, for instance. I could if I wanted to, but I don't have to because that's what my dad did. Therefore, someone's not. We have a little ability to shift up or down the economic class category. We can move all over the world. We can change political parties. We can change cell phone providers. We can change the brand of beer or soda we drink. We can redefine and define ourselves. Maybe a little more. Maybe not as much as we think we can, but more than people used to. But people still get clicky. People will still label and categorize and pigeonhole you and they'll do it to others. People will tell you what you can or can't do. People will still exalt some and marginalize others, all based on your neighborhood, your parents, your ethnicity, your job, your age, gender, your orientation, your politics, or any other fundamentally arbitrary qualifier. And we do the same kind of sorting of people, too, sometimes unconsciously, because that's just the way the world works. As Christians, as ones who have been baptized with water and spirit, we have been made heirs and inheritors of God's promises by the grace of God. We have been born from above, born anew, however you want to call it. And our earthly honor status has been reset. We are on equal footing as children of God to be God's agents, God's megaphones, of playing field leveling, to proclaim God's open invitation, open door policy, no pedigree required, no experience necessary to be a child of God. God promises us so much, blesses us so much, eternal life, salvation, forgiveness of sins, yes, but also the Spirit's gifts, the Spirit's intercession when words fail us, a shepherd who knows our voice, a bread that leaves us never wanting more, a water that forever quenches our thirst, a Lord who watches over our coming in and our going out, who protects our days and nights, who calls us good and loved and worthy and more and more and more, who makes us family and second. We get to tell people about these promises. We get to live these promises towards other people. And the catch, this has got to be a catch, right? What's the catch? What's the requirement to receive all these riches of love and all these promises? There is no catch. We just trust it. We believe in our whole hearts that God is love, that Jesus did die for us, that the Spirit does activate, guide our lives, that we are indeed born from above. Reset and made anew, children of God. Our world is still full of layers and circles and people telling each other, you don't belong here. Know your place. If you don't believe that, step outside your own layers. Step outside your circle and see what happens. See how people treat you. Be aware of your reactions to others. Be aware of the velvet ropes that you yourself maintain. God is still changing the rules, still leveling the playing field right now towards equal inheritance of God's promises through faith. When God sent the Son into the world so that everyone 
who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life, that everyone was not restricted to a certain group or to just the first century. It's still flowing today and tomorrow and beyond. We don't have fairy tale medallions proclaiming our birth status and swooping us into the wedding of our dreams of the last one. <clears throat> but we do have a mark on our heads. We do come from promise laden waters. We've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And that secures our place in God's lineage and family. And as hard as it can be to admit it, that status comes for free, without our own. For that I say thanks be to God. Yeah. The hymn of the day is called Just As I Am, Without One Foot. The five hundred and eighty.
Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. O oh God, you love your church. Raise up leaders who care for your people. Bless lay theologians, seminary and college professors, and all who are called to the ministry of teaching, that they form and inspire us for the work of the gospel. Merciful God, Receive our prayer. O God, you so love your creation. Breathe new life into our planetary home. Guide the work of researchers, scientists, and activists who love your earth and who inspire us to care for the natural world. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. O God, you so love the world. Uphold leaders who resist tyranny and oppression. Strengthen organizations that promote peace and harmony. Direct their work to alleviate human suffering and to address its root causes. Merciful God. O oh God, you so love our people. Draw near to all who live with mental illness, depression, or addiction, and accompany them in healing and recovery. Hear the cries of those who look to you in their distress. Especially we pray for each other, Leroy, Debbie, Bruce, Johnny, Adam, Bonnie, Jackie, Emily, Ted, Stephen, Sue, Karen, Abby, and Ruth. We also pray for our extended family and neighbors, Justin, Bubba, Cheryl, Wayne, family and friends of the Crumb family, Ashley, Griffin, the Grazia family, Amy, Linda, Lars, Joan, Jenna, Tim, Mary, Keith, Charles, Sam, Susan. We also pray, pray for our veterans, their fellow soldiers and waiting families, all law enforcement, firefighters and first responders, the people and pastor, Reverend Catherine Walsall's Episcopal in our shared ministry, for your continued healing for the lasting effects of COVID in all areas of life. All those impacted by acts of violence at home and abroad, all who travel. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Oh God, you so love your children. Bless the young in our midst and delight us with your joy, wonder, and curiosity. Provide our ministries with children and youth and equip us all for faithful discipleship. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, you so love your saints. As our ancestors in the faith have been a blessing to us, so inspire us by their example of holy living to be a blessing to those who come after us. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. God of relationship, eternal three in one, thank you for blessing us with the families in our lives of all configurations. When we are down, they lift us up. We know that you make yourself known in our lives through them. This week, we pray especially for the Walton, Warnerud, and Weaver families, as well as our Messiah family. We are never alone because you are here with us through our loved ones. Thank you for showing us that love and care can be found anywhere, especially in our families, and help us share your love in turn. Merciful God. We lift our prayers to you, O oh God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Also with you. It's your sign of peace for you. Thank you, sir.
Let us pray together. God, our provider, you know the of the bread of God, of the words of grace and life. Bless us in the gifts of it, which we receive from our God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and hearts and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that Renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs>
Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.